Okay. Um, everybody signed in and got a city sheet? Okay. Um, I was reading in my daily devotional reading today in the book of Kings. It talks about um, when Joash, it's a very involved story about how he even became a king, uh, especially at the age of seven. It talks about how Joash was a good king as long as Jehoiada, the priest, was alive. But when Jehoiada died, um, Joash started listening to the wrong people. He started drifting away from what God's word said. And he and he ended up, the story of so many in, in scripture is having this great start to his life and ended up far away from God <clears throat> as a result. And, and I think about that story sometimes as a, as a minister. And it, it highlights how important leaders are and, and people of influence are, but it also highlights how important it is that each of us own our own faith. How each of us, if, if the whole world fell apart and every person in our life who was an influence for good left our side, we would still be faithful to God because it's our thing. And apparently Joash didn't have that. Um, he had, he had Je Jehoiada's faith, but he didn't ever have his own faith. And so what God had to do when uh, Joash began to abandon, Joash began to abandon uh, God's word is God sent prophets. And the prophets, of course, warned uh, the people about what would happen. The Bible says that the people didn't listen. And that brings us right back to Jeremiah. What would they do? What would the people of Joash's day do with the, with the word of God? Well, what we're going to see tonight is regardless of how people respond to God's word, God's word endures. Um, Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away, or heaven and earth will pass away, but my word endures forever. And so let's see that tonight. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Somebody read uh, verses 10 and 11 and chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. I answered, who would listen if I spoke to them and warned them? Their ears are so closed that they cannot hear. Indeed, what the Lord says is offensive to them. They do not like it at all. I am as full of anger as you are, Lord. I'm tired of trying to hold it in. The Lord answered, vent it then on the children who play in the street and on the young men who are gathered together. Husbands and wives are to be included, as well as the old and those who are advanced in years. Chapter 8, 8 and 9. How can you say we are wise? We have the law of the Lord. The truth is, those who teach it have used their writings to make it say what it does not really mean. Your wise men will be put to shame. They will be dumbfounded and be brought to judgment. Since they have rejected the word of the Lord, what wisdom do they really have? So here we have a glimpse into how the people of Jeremiah's day were dealing with the word of God. And so the Israelites found the word of God. Uh, the chapter 6 passage says the word of God was offensive to them. 
Second passage, chapter 8, they were twisting the word of God. And by twisting the word of God, Israel's teachers were rejecting what God said. We find the same reaction to the word of God today. So I want you to complete the following. Instead of God's word, people want what? Instead of God's word, people want fill in the blank. Something that will justify their way. All right. They want something that will justify their way of life. What else? An easy life, okay? What they want to hear. What they want to hear. Whatever makes them happy. <coughs> Immediate gratification. Immediate gratification. Um, and, and hearing pleasant words is, is fine and wonderful, but you don't get the whole counsel of God if all you're looking for is the positive, is the pleasant, is the optimistic word. Because there are times that God has to, to issue warnings to people, and that's what Jeremiah is doing. So let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm going to read uh, several sections of it. Uh, somebody, again, you see it there, verses 1 through 8, verse 16, 21 through 24, and then 27 and 28. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, Son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sins. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I am not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who came in from their town. <clears throat> Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each turn from their wicked ways, for the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord are great. Six, Six, 16. Oh, I don't read yeah, well, I'm, I'm, okay. I, this, is, this all fits together, but in, for time's sake, I okay. just I picked certain verses. Uh, yeah. um, when they heard all these words, they looked at each other in fear and said to Baruch, We must report all these words to the king. Okay. The 21. king sent Jehuda to get the scroll, and Jehuda brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. When Jehuda had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with a scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. The king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. After the king burned the scroll containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's <coughs> dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll when Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, burned up. Okay, so here, here you have um, <laughs> Jeremiah dictating to Baruch and saying, uh, here's what I want you to write down. I, I, want, to, I want to share this with the people. And it's given to the king, and the king has a reaction to it. Okay. Um, 
God instructed Jeremiah to write all his prophecies down in hopes that it would stir the people to repentance. How did the king react? And how is it possible to do the same today? How did he react to that? <clears throat> he them up. Here, here's what's interesting is he didn't take the collection and just throw them in the fire. What's that, what's that communicating that he meticulously would cut out little sections at a time? What's that, what's that indicate? He enjoyed that. He was intentional. Or those were the parts that really hit home and stepped on his toes, but they had to go away. Yeah, I don't like this. <laughs> Just use your knife, okay? I, I understand that our third president, Thomas Jefferson, had a similar Bible. But he cut out any of the parts that he didn't believe or didn't agree with. And uh, so that's what we see with, um, with the king. So he said, I don't like this, I don't like that, I'll burn it in the fire. How does that happen? To, how can that happen today? The same thing, you know, we do some things and other things we don't. We don't do, you know, we pick out pick and cheese, but, you know, we have to uh, abide by everything. Something. How do we justify that, Tammy? How do we justify that? Just picking out what we want and discarding what we don't want. You know, that's what you think. I don't want to do that. So, I will do. I can deal with this, but I can't deal with that. So, you don't, I mean, whatever your justification is, you do that. Someone tell me, what? how do we justify that? We just interpret it how we want to interpret it. All right. Sometimes it's as simple as we apply our own interpretation to it the way we want it to be. So it can accommodate to our own lives. Okay. Yeah. We cut out things that we cut out the things that perhaps makes us guilty. We're selective, like the king was. Sometimes we think that some things apply to us, sometimes some other things doesn't apply to us. Yeah. Yeah, this 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 part here is it it was for it was for a different time. It's, so it's it's irrelevant to me. And there are parts of the Bible that were specific to a certain people at a certain time. Okay. But to read the Bible and say things like, well, it's outdated. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't apply to today. Picking and choosing verses as if the Bible is a self-help book, or it's the power of positive thinking where we look for signs or we look for our favorite verses is not the way to read the Bible. Um, you can't make God's word go away so easily. And so, what, what did God do? What did God set, tell uh, Jeremiah to do after the king demolished the first version? Go back and write it again. And, and don't you know that there was a certain frustration with that? You ever had to do something twice because of somebody else's mistake? Now, don't look at anybody in the room who may have been that person. But um, we, we can understand how frustrated Jeremiah would have been on this occasion, but God was not going to allow his word to just simply be dismissed like that. Okay? But it's still possible to treat God's word that way. I don't like that. I don't like that part. So let's just not read that part. Or let's ignore that part. So 
kind of significant how uh, said to write it exactly uh, in regard to the first one. Which to do it exactly would would suggest to me that he'd have to have the Holy Spirit's help yeah. in doing that. I was doing it all from memory probably wasn't very uh, possible. Additional thoughts about this. Here we see God's word divinely given to Jeremiah, and the king is arrogant enough <coughs> to just slice it up. There's no fear of God there. Any thoughts about that? Let's read on. I think a couple things. Yeah. If we don't have a fear of the Lord and a heart for the Lord, we're going to be in trouble. No matter back then, right now, in between. And that's what we see about the old kings of the Old Testament is they didn't have a heart for the Lord. They didn't have a fear of the Lord. So do we, should we be surprised that they were in the, in the predicament they were in? Here, here we see the king, the person who's supposed to be leading the people. This is his attitude toward God's word and by connection toward God. This is his attitude toward God. So should we be surprised that these people are about to be destroyed by the Babylonians? Mm -mm. It, it was time for them to experience um, the judgment that they had built up by the attitude that they had toward God over the years. Okay. Jeremiah 20. Somebody read 7 through 9, and then we'll turn to 17, 15. We read this last week. Oh, Lord, you deceived me. And I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the Lord, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it. Uh, uh, holding it in, indeed, I cannot. 1715. <coughs> uh, they keep saying to me, where's the word of the Lord? Let it now be fulfilled. Okay. Um... <laughs> Anybody see any comedy in verse 15? The people are clamoring. Where's the word of God? Get us the word of God. Let it now be fulfilled. What's almost comical about that? They don't want to hear it first. The word of God is back in the ear. Where is the word of God? They don't want us to do it. God's given him in the word through Jeremiah. But they don't like it. Didn't want to hear it either. Didn't want to hear it. So here's the question. Speaking for God brought Jeremiah insults and trouble. People were skeptical about his words. They demanded to see his prophecies fulfilled. Why were people skeptical about Jeremiah's prophecies? Well, he wasn't the only prophet, and they didn't all have the same message. Good. So in fairness to the people, uh, they had several people who claimed to be prophets who spoke very differently than Jeremiah, while Jeremiah often stood alone. And, and so just think about that for a minute. You have one group of people, and there's a number of them, and they seem to kind of be saying the same thing. Israel's o Israel is okay. Uh, we've got peace. God's, o God's happy with us. We're, we're all right. We've got this one guy who's over here who sounds like a lunatic because he's not saying the same thing everybody else is. 
If, if you're if you're one of the people, who, who would you listen to and why? You'd listen to the one that fits your idea of the way things should be in the easy way. Yeah. Plus they've got numbers. Um, how hard it is to be the lone dissenting voice and to follow that guy. Every, I mean, those of you who have kids and, and you probably at some point had your children come home and say these words, everybody else is doing it. Right? Everybody else is doing it. And you're the one dissenting voice. At least that's how it's being presented by your children. So in, in, a, in a way, I, um, I want to be fair to the people. Uh, by pure numbers, why would you believe it? A, a guy who's, who's bringing a, a terrible warning to the people. So similar to Elijah's day, when the people, remember Elijah had the confrontation with the prophets of Baal and Asherah up on Mount Carmel. And it's one man, Elijah, to the, is it, was it 900 and, I can't remember the exact number. We'll say for, for, for illustration sakes, First Kings chapter 18, if somebody wants to look it up, uh, 850, maybe it's 850 prophets of Baal and the Shear. One guy against 850. And when Jeremiah, uh, or excuse me, when Elijah spoke to the people, he said, choose today. Who, who are you going to follow? Quit. Quit wavering between two opinions, he says. Because they were trying to, to straddle the fence, worshiping Baal and the Shira, as well as Yahweh. And he says, make up your mind. Yeah, 450. It's 450 of one of them. Oh, yeah, so it'd be 900 total. Because it says 450 prophets of Baal and the 400... Or so 850, yeah, profits of the share. Somebody <laughs> said 850. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we weren't. <laughs> um, I didn't know there's going to be math in this class. I, 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 it's, it's, it's expecting too much. <laughs> and you remember what the people's reaction was when, when Elijah said, Make a decision. Corey, you're there. What was the people's reaction? Silence. For what part? How the people reacted when Elijah said, make a choice. The people reacted with silence. They wouldn't make a decision. Okay? And so again, we, we there's a this is a study in many ways, not only of Jeremiah and, and the prophets and prophecy and of God. It's also a study in human nature. People were non-committal because they were ignorant. I don't know who to choose. And so they were silent. Um, they were inclined to believe what they could see and experience. And that's why they said, let Jeremiah's words be fulfilled. I want to see proof that his prophecies are true. And guess what? They're going to get to see them. And it's not going to be what they want to see. And so I think about that and I think, well, today, I mean, if, if you're, I, when I first started uh, preaching back in West Virginia, 
There was a prediction made. I don't even remember who the group was who made the prediction that um, in 1994, I believe, maybe not, that wouldn't be right. Maybe it's 1991 that Jesus was going to return. Okay. And so I get a call from one of our, our members and said, I heard this person say that, that Jesus was going to return. <clears throat> what would you have said to her? Because she was panicking. She was panicking. I say that the Bible tells us that we won't know the And that is what I told her. Um, I, I'm not sure she was completely relieved, though. Why do people struggle in our world even today with similar kinds of situations? I mean, I, I've had a recent conversation with a young person who came and told me some things and that were disturbing this person about um, their relationship with God. And I said, where did you learn those things? And this person said, this is what I've always been told. And I said, they're not biblical. They're not biblical. So how do we deal with all the voices out there? Because they're there. I had a question just last night given to me and said, hey, how are we, what, what do we believe different from this group? And my response was, there are lots of differences from that group. How do we know what to listen to, who to listen to? All right, we need, we've got scripture, so we should be going to it and utilize it. To pray for wisdom, to discern. Pray for wisdom to discern, humble wisdom to discern. You know, if you've done those two and you still don't know, you know, the Bible says to seek wise counsel, someone you can trust spiritually, not just what you want to hear, or just some buddies, I mean, somebody that you trust that's, Strong in their faith in the Lord and their knowledge of God's word. Yeah. Rehoboam, you know, what Rehoboam was told to do. He didn't do it, but he was told to do it. Yeah. Seek wise counsel. And that's another great example of a guy who was listening to the wrong voices. And I'm telling you, it's rampant. Um, and here's the problem with it. When you listen to the wrong voices, what's going to happen in your life? Wrong choices. You make the wrong choices. And you wonder why God let you down. Now, part of, part of the reason I'm sharing with this is to make us more conscious about it for our own selves, but also conscious that people around us are oftentimes in those shoes so that we can be merciful and be agents of God's truth in their life. Okay? Because that's where the that's where the Israelites were. One guy, Jeremiah, he's 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 trying to call him, but he's just one guy against all these others. And so they didn't listen to him. Okay. Um Jeremiah 35. One through six. This is a this is one of the most remarkable passages. It confounded God even. So this is uh, Jeremiah thirty five one through six, and then twelve through sixteen. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord of Asa, Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers, then offer them wine to drink. 
So I took Jaz Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, son of Habasiniah, and his brothers, <laughs> and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. I brought them to the house of the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Idaliah, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, uh, above the chamber of Masaiah, the son of Shalom, keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, drink wine. But they answered, we will drink no wine for Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of uh, Rekha, our father, commands us, you shall not drink wine, neither, your, neither you nor your sons forever. 12 to 16. Uh, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus said the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares the Lord. The command that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine has been, has been kept and they drink none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from, the, from his evil way, and amend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to serve them, and then you shall dwell in the land that I gave you to uh, give you and your fathers. But you did not incline your ear or listen to me. The sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the command that their father gave them, but this people has not obeyed me. Here we are introduced to the amazing Rechabite clan. They refused to drink alcohol of any kind because their forefather Jonadab so God tests, you know, he brings he brings some of the Rechabites in and he said, Hey, so set wine before the tell them to drink. And what they, what they, how did they respond? Why not? The father told us not to. What point is God trying to make? Their example. Problem is not obedience. Come on. I mean, if they can withstand from that, because that's something that they want to do, then they shouldn't have any problem. It's basically that they're not determining that what Jeremiah is saying is the truth that they should listen to. They're capable of obeying. That's not the problem, as you said. So what's the problem? Did you, did you hear what God said in verses 12 through 16? What did God say? I've given you commands. I've sent prophets. I've blessed you. What they do with what he said. That was puzzling even to God. How can you live? How can you recognize listen to your forefather for generations and you won't listen to the Rechabites were not necessarily guilty of this, but Israel, Israel. How can, how can the Rechabites be so loyal to their earthly father and <clears throat> you can't be loyal to me? It's, it's a sad uh, commentary that a flawed earthly father could be faithfully obeyed for generations without question, but Almighty God and Father in Heaven can be so easily ignored 
who knows what is best, speaks out of love. How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of that? Doesn't make sense, does it? Doesn't. And so it was perplexing even to God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I don't think there are any um, uh, long names in the Hebrews. <laughs> Just proof it first. We sort of yeah. commentarian. Yeah. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Period. Okay. So the word of God is living, whether people listen to it or not. But in order to tap into that life-giving source, how must we read God's word? We're seeing examples tonight through the, the life and ministry of Jeremiah of a people who didn't pay attention to God's word. And so guess what? They experienced separation and spiritual death from God. If we want to access the life-giving power of God's word. What what how do we need to read his word? As we should be without adding or taking away anything. All right. <coughs> one, one thing is necessary is that we read it as it is without adding our ideas or subtracting what we don't like as we saw the king do. How else? <coughs> expecting that you have a desire to follow it and obey it. All right. Expecting. You need to read it with anticipation of how you're going to apply it and live by it in your life. The pure and open heart. Pure and open heart. Think of the things it can't be. Because you hit on the things that are an important part of whether you can't. you can't read God's word and ignore it. You're not going to tap into the life giving source. You can't just read to teach others. You can't read and think about how it applies to others. Read scripture and say, Boy, I hope my spouse is paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids, if they're get, getting, can't read it that way. You can't see it as outdated and irrelevant. It can't be academic, it has to be personal. This gets back to what I was talking about at the very beginning of class. Joash didn't have his faith. He had Jehoiada's faith. Now, I don't know how, I don't know how you break through that, okay? I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Joash was a great king, a godly man, as long as Jehoiada was <clears throat> But when Jehoiada was out of the way, so was God. So we need to encourage one another to be able to read the word of God in a personal way. As you've, as you've said, asking God to examine us, open our eyes, be willing to obey even when it's hard. It can't just be information. It must be a textbook for living. Okay. Comments, questions. Textbook for living. Jeremiah 44. 26 through 30.
But hear the word of the Lord, all you Jews living in Egypt. I swear by my great name, says the Lord, that no one from Judah living anywhere in Egypt will ever again invoke my name or swear, as surely as the sovereign Lord lives. For I am watching over them for harm, not for good. The Jews in Egypt will perish by sword and famine until they are all destroyed. Those who escape the sword and return to the land of Judah from Egypt will be very few. And the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. This will be the sign to you that I will punish you in this place, declares the Lord, so that you will know that my threats of harm against you will surely stand. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to deliver Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hands of his enemies who want to kill him, just as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the enemy who wanted to kill him. Okay, so God is effectively saying, listen, you want you want proof? I'll give you proof. Uh, we will see whose word stands. We will see whose word endures, their words or mine. And so he gives some, some definitive signs about um, the king of uh, or the Pharaoh of Egypt and how he would be uh, delivered to his enemies in the same way that King Zedekiah was. So here's the question. The word of God, just as, as previous question highlighted the fact that the word of God is living. This question says the word of God is true whether people trust him or not. How did God say that Israel would know that his word is true? How would, how would they know that his word is true? Didn't they see uh, the Pharaoh given to the hand of them? All right. So whenever what he has said happens, now, here's an important, I think, lesson for us. The problem with many humans is that we wait and watch before we believe. Sometimes the problem <clears throat> is we get impatient. And so when we don't see what we expect to see, we do what we want to do anyway. That's what King Saul did. Sometimes we don't have faith enough to act on what God has said. So we end up experiencing the judgment of God because we would not trust his word. That's Israel. Okay, that's where Israel was. And so what's the lesson for I mean, what are you hearing? What, what's, how is this ringing personal for you tonight? Because we're talking about what we do with the Word of God and whether it's personal or not. What, what, what's, what's it saying to you? Trust the, trust His Word and trust His timing, not our timing or. Don't be blown by the wind. No pun intended today. But, but you know, <laughs> it's easy for us to hear what our 18 years want to hear from people in the world, but God's words is only the truth. I mean, his word is truth, not by somebody that has a lot of zeal or charisma in this world that may think they know what's right. But God's word is truth. And that's really, like you've mentioned earlier, I mean, we should always go to God's word as our answer first, if, we're, if in question or someone, you know, we need to be ready for people to ask questions like things that, that the world is going to talk about. Because people want to hear, they want to be, um, I guess, they want to be enticed or they want to be, um, you know, they want drama. You know, they, want, they want excitement. So we need to be ready to answer things like that. Or whatever in our own family or whatever to, to just point to God's word first and then go from there. 
as a preacher, as you might suppose, I get asked a lot of religious questions. Um, I'm just always a little bit troubled by the things that people believe that are that are not in scripture at all but they believe them as though they are and so again we have unique opportunities to point people to god's word and i hope we do that okay last question uh somebody read jeremiah 35 verse 10, uh, 13. This is a good culminating verse for our study tonight. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord? That's pretty blunt, isn't it? Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words? He was talking about, he was referring back to the Rechabites again. God made the point that his word is the standard whether people submit or not. So not only is God's word living and God's word true, God's word is the standard whether people submit to it or not. So what is the lesson that God wanted Israel to learn? He says, uh, we learn a let we not learn a lesson and obey my words. What, what's the lesson he wanted them to learn? Whether they accept it or not, it's his word and that's it. Okay. So accept his word as his word. What's the lesson? What do you hear God saying through what we've studied and looked at tonight? If you just listen, you could avoid a lot of calamity. Listen from the beginning. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. Yeah. And that his word never changes. It's like he told him to go and and you like the same thing again, it's not going to change. You don't like it, that's the thing. <clears throat> we get to see all of that happen to them as sad and as infuriating as that was on a smaller scale for our life. We get to learn from their mistakes. Hopefully, we don't have people you know, hungering our nation necessarily, but in our life, we have to learn from their mistakes. He was so patient with them, but I think it's to prove that we have to make good choices or that's going to happen to us. So. Good. Keep going if you got more. Choices have so consequences. Choices have consequences. consequences. So I think the lesson is to, to keep us strong. So if you would have listened to me, you would not have those consequences coming to you. Yeah, that's in this, a, in, in this in this is gonna happen. It's gonna break them. It's gonna break. It's gonna it's gonna break the nation. And and when we see the course of history, they never went back to it. Apologize. Never reclaimed their greatness. And, and there, that's the first thing I have on your art. On, on my answer. When you reject the word of God, you can only expect painful consequences. That's all you've got to expect. Um, that was true then. It's true now. It's true now. I think it's a good sign that people are using God's word as the source of authority, but we have to be careful about how it's used and how it's interpreted. Jeremiah said, 
Some of them are twisting you know, what was being said. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Peter said, some people twist or distort things written by Paul, just as the false prophets did in Jeremiah's day. So how do you know? I talked about this just a minute ago. How do you know? Well, we mentioned being prayerful. We, we mentioned uh, considering who is speaking and what he is saying and uh, consulting godly um, wisdom, people we regard with godly wisdom. Here's, here's the interesting thing. Unpopular messages are often the truth. So, so what I've learned over the years is if it's if it's a, a message that's counter to almost everything else being said, I pay attention to that. Because there's probably some merit to it. Okay. And that was what was going on in Jer Jeremiah's day. So, again, being discerners of God's word. Uh, I don't think everybody out there who is speaking untruth is doing so maliciously. Um, but if we're going to be able to know what is truth and be loyal to God's word, we have to be discerning. In, in what we listen to and who we listen to. Uh, occasionally, I will get somebody to come and say, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? I say, never heard of them. Well, uh, look it up on the internet. And so I'll look up on the internet and I'll say, I'm not sure that's who I would listen to. Um because of something, you know, that a particular belief they say. And I'm not saying that I should be the ultimate source. I mean, you 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 should be making sure that I'm speaking from God's word. And so it's important, um, as we've seen tonight, to be loyal to God's word. And I hope you will. Have a blessed week.